Now recently I put out a feeler post on Facebook to see what topics you guys would like to learn about here on History Of. I received a handsome amount of good ideas but was completely intrigued by this one submitted by Justin Graham. Thanks Justin for submitting the idea for this video. Today we're going to be looking at the history of the Jeep. The year was 1941. Franklin Delano Roosevelt was in the White House. Citizen Kane was in theaters nationwide. Chattanooga Choo Choo by Glenn Miller was topping the billboard charts, but all was not well in the world. Europe was in the heart of World War II. Thousands, if not more Jewish Europeans, had already been forced into labor camps. The effects of the Nazi war effort were felt across the globe, and the U.S. military, fearing its inevitable involvement drawing more and more near, shopped 135 different U.S. auto manufacturers to create a quick, lightweight reconnaissance vehicle in a may-the-best-design-win steel cage match situation. And the Bantam BRC-40 came out the victor. After successfully meeting all the Army's requirements for a reconnaissance car, the BRC-40 was well-liked by the government and the military alike. Additional BRC-40s were ordered for the Lindley's shipments to allied nations, eventually totaling an estimated 2,605 BRC-40s, 62 of which had four-wheel steering as requested by the United States Cavalry. They were produced from March 31st through December 6th of 1941. The BRC-40 didn't look like the Jeep you may think of when somebody says Jeep, although you can clearly see the roots forming. For starters, the grille had tubular bars instead of flat slats like the Jeeps of modern recollection. It had flat front fenders, recessed headlights, and a folding windshield. And the feature that I found the most interesting, no gas pedal. That's right, I said it didn't have a gas pedal. The BRC40 used a floor-mounted starter button for starting and a hand throttle in the dash to set the speed. One can only imagine how counterintuitive that would be to operate considering a good 99% of us have only driven cars with gas pedals. Now, if you've had the opportunity to drive a Bantam BRC40, please share your experience in the comments below. We're all very interested. All right, moving on. Bantam's inability to keep up with the rapid production of wartime vehicles, as well as their limited design and production facilities, led the Army's decision to recruit Delmar G. Roos, the executive vice president and chief engineer of Willis Overland Motors, to provide a vehicle similar to the Bantam's design, and the Willis MB was born. The Bantams already in service were passed to the British and Russian armies under the terms of the Lend-Lease Act. Willis MB Jeeps went into production specifically for the military, arguably making them the oldest four-wheel drive mass production vehicles now known as SUVs. The Jeep became the primary light four-wheel drive vehicle of the United States Army and the Allies during World War II. Since the War Department required a large number of vehicles to be manufactured in a relatively short time, Willis Overland granted the United States government a non-exclusive license to allow another company to manufacture vehicles using the Willis specification. The Army chose Ford as the second supplier, building Jeeps to the Willis design. Willis supplied Ford with a complete set of plans and specifications, while the original Ford GWPs were identical to the Willis design. Ford is credited with making one small alteration to the design that later became a staple with Jeep when they designed designed the iconic seven-slot grille in an attempt to make the Ford GWP distinguishable from the Willis MB, which had a nine-slot grille. All modern civilian Jeeps sport the Ford-designed seven-slot grille even today. The Spartan, cramped, and highly functional Jeep became the ambiquitous World War II four-wheeled personification of Yankee ingenuity and cocky can-do determination. The Willis Overland MB Jeep saw heavy action in the war. It provided the military with unprecedented versatility and is even credited with modernizing warfare. President Eisenhower would go on to say that America could not have won World War II without the Jeep. The Jeep has been widely imitated around the world, including Japan by Mitsubishi Motors and Toyota. The utilitarian good looks of the original Jeep have been hailed by industrial designers and museum curators alike. The Museum of Modern Art described the Jeep as a masterpiece of functionalist design and has periodically exhibited the Jeep as part of its collection. Ernie Pyle called the Jeep, along with the Coleman GI pocket stove, the two most important pieces of non-combat equipment ever developed. Jeeps became even more famous following the war as they became available on the surplus market. Some ads claimed to offer Jeeps still in the factory crate. This legend persisted for decades despite the fact that Jeeps were never shipped from the factory in crates. Willis, which produced the first civilian Jeep, the CJ-1, in 1945, is the only company that continually produced Jeep vehicles after the war. In June 1950, Willis Overland was granted the privilege of owning the name Jeep as a registered trademark. The CJ-1 
one was an MB that had been modified by adding a tailgate, draw bar, and a civilian style canvas top. But none of the CJ1s built have survived, and it's not known how many were built. Although it bore the CJ name, the Willis Overland CJ2 was not really available for retail. The CJ2s, also known as Agri Jeeps, were the second generation prototype for the first production civilian Jeep and were used solely for testing purposes. It was directly based on the military Willis MB using the same Willis Go Devil engine, but stripped of all military features, particularly the blackout lighting. They had taillights, power takeoffs, engine governors, column shift, T90 manual transmissions, a 2.4 3 to 1 low range transfer case, and driver side tool indentions. The earlier models had brass plaques on the hood and windshield that read Jeep. Later models were stamped Jeep, a la the familiar Willis stamping that appears on the CJ2A and later models. Some CJ2s had Agri-Jeep plaques affixed to the dash. The spare tire was mounted forward of the passenger side rear wheel of the earlier models and aft of the rear wheel on the later ones. It seems that CJ2s were distributed to agricultural stations for evaluation purposes. Out of 45 CJ2s built, only 10 have survived and only one serial number CJ09 has been restored. The lessons learned with the CJ2 led to the development of the first full production CJ, the 1945-49 through 49 Willis Overland CJ2A. The CJ2A looked very much like the civilianized MB with the tailgate and side-mounted spare tire. One major difference between the MB and the CJ2A were the grills of the two vehicles. The MB had recessed headlights and 9-slot grills while the CJ2A CJ2A had larger headlights flush mounted and a Ford designed 7 slot grill. The CJ2A was still powered by the reliable L134 Go Devil engine. Many of the early CJ2As were produced using surplus military Jeep parts such as engine blocks and in a few cases, modified frames. Some of the use of surplus parts was due to the strikes at suppliers such as Autolite. Since Willis produced few parts in-house and relied heavily on suppliers, it was vulnerable to strikes. Unfortunately for Willis, strikes were common post-war. This undoubtedly contributed to the low production totals in 1945 and early 46. The Willis Overland CJ3A was introduced in 1949 and was in production until 1953. It was powered by Willis's 60 horsepower L134 Go Devil. The CJ3A had beefed up suspension to accommodate the various agricultural implements that were being built for the vehicle. Another difference was a shorter rear wheel well. A bare bones farm Jeep version was available starting in 1951 with a power takeoff. 131,843 CJ3As were produced before before the series ended in 1953. About 550 of the CJ3As were assembled by Mitsubishi as the J1, J2 in late 1952 and early 53, exclusively for the Japanese police and forestry agencies. Willis was sold to Kaiser Motors in 1953, which later became Kaiser Jeep in 1963. The Willis CJ3B replaced the CJ3A in 1953, the same year Willis was sold to Kaiser. Kaiser removed Overland from the subcompany name. The CJ3B introduced a higher grill and hood to clear the new Willis Hurricane engine. The CJ3B was produced until 1968 with a total of about 196,000 produced. The Willis CJ5, or as it's often referred to as the Jeep CJ5, was influenced by new corporate owner Kaiser and the Korean War M38A1 Jeep. American Motors Corporation, or AMC, purchased Kaiser's money-losing Jeep operation in 1970. The utility vehicle complemented AMC's passenger car business by sharing components, achieving volume efficiencies as well as capitalizing on Jeep's international and government markets. The CJ5 had a multitude of special models offered between 1961 and 1983, including the 1961 Tuxedo Park, 62 Tuxedo Park Mark II, 63 Tuxedo Park Mark III, 1965 Tuxedo Park Mark IV, the 1969 Camper, 1969 462, 1970 Renegade, 1971 Renegade II, 73 Super Jeep, 77 Golden Eagle, 1979 Silver Anniversary, 1980 Golden Hawk, and the 1980 Laredo. There was a CJ6 model produced, however, it was not very popular in the United States. Most CJ6 models were sold to Sweden and South America. It was also a symbol in South Africa by Volkswagen's local subsidiary. The Jeep CJ7 featured a wheelbase 10 inches longer than that of the CJ5 and lacked its trademark rear curve of the door cutouts. The other main difference between the CJ5 and the CJ7 was to the chassis, which consisted of two parallel longitudinal main C-section rails. To help improve the vehicle handling and 
and stability. The rear section of the chassis stepped out to allow the spring and shock absorbers to be mounted closer to the outside of the body. It was introduced in the 1976 model year with 379,299 built during the 11 years of production. The French automaker Renault began investing in AMC in 1979. However, a December 1980 60 Minutes segment where the Insurance Institute of Highway Safety staged a demonstration to illustrate that the CJ5 was apt to roll over in routine road circumstances at relatively low speeds. Years later, it was revealed that the testers only managed to achieve eight rollovers out of 435 runs through a corner. The Insurance Institute requested the testers implemented vehicle loading, which was hanging weights in the vehicle's corner inside the body where they were not apparent to the camera in order to generate worst case scenario conditions for stability. The CJ8 was a long wheelbase version of the CJ7 introduced in 1981 and manufactured through 1986. It featured a 103 inch wheelbase and a removable half cab, creating a small pickup style box instead of utilizing a separate pickup bed. The CJ8s used the traditional transfer case with manual front locking hubs to engage the four-wheel drive. Most had either a four or five-speed manual transmission, but a three-speed automatic transmission was an option. By 1987, the automobile markets had changed and even Renault itself was experiencing financial troubles. At the same time, the Chrysler Corporation wanted to capture the Jeep brand as well as other assets of AMC. The Jeep YJ, sold as the Wrangler in the United States, replaced the CJ in 1986 and was built in Brampton, Ontario, Canada until the plant closed on April 23, 1992. Production was then moved to Toledo, Ohio using the same plant that produced the original Willis Jeeps during World War II. Chrysler bought out an AMC in 1987, shortly after the Jeep CJ7 was replaced with the AMC designed Jeep Wrangler or the YJ. In 1990, development of a successor to the YJ began in Chrysler's Jeep Truck Engineering Pre-Program Department under Bob Sheaves and TJ Program Director Craig Wynn. Mules based on the YJ were built from 1990 to 1993. Verification prototypes using production bodies were built from early 1994 and tested through late 1995. As YJ production ceased in December of 1995, the last pre-production TJ examples were assembled with start of series production in January 1996. Chrysler merged with Daimler-Benz in 1998 to form Daimler-Chrysler. Daimler-Chrysler eventually sold most of their interest in Chrysler to a private equity company in 2007. In April 2004, Jeep introduced the 2004 and a half Wrangler Unlimited LJ with a 10 inch longer wheelbase, a Dana 44 rear axle and a 373 gear ratio at the command track NV231 transfer case. In late 2004, Jeep released the Rubicon Unlimited, which has the wheelbase of the Unlimited and the off-road features of the Rubicon, such as front and rear Dana 44 axles with the Rock Track NV241 four wheel drive system, diamond plate rocker guards, a six speed manual transmission and other comfort and convenience options not offered on other Wranglers. The 2007 model year brought a complete redesign of the Jeep Wrangler and also a four-door model. The TJ chassis was replaced by the all-new JK platform. This next generation Wrangler was noticeably wider than the previous model with a 3.4 inch wider track. And though the two-door model has a two inch longer wheelbase, it is actually 2.5 inches shorter in overall length than the TJ, allowing for a 44.3 degree approach angle and a 40.4 degree departure angle. With a larger factory available tire size of 32 inches, the breakover angle on the Rubicon is increased from 22.6 degrees to 25.4 degrees. And dragons and sorcery and other nerdy stuff. Chrysler and the Jeep division operated under Chrysler Group LLC until December 15, 2014, when the name was changed to Fiat Chrysler Automobiles or FCA US LLC as it remains today. The story of the Jeep is one of American ingenuity and tenacity combining to create what in a word can only be described as success. Jeep owners belong to a special community of Americans that value functionality as well as style that doesn't deviate far from its roots at all. There's even a semi-secret code amongst Jeep drivers called the Jeep Wave, where two Jeep owners having never met one another could pass on a busy street and still wave at one another as if they'd known each other for years. There are even rules to this code stating that all Jeep Wrangler or predecessor drivers must wave to other Wrangler or Wrangler predecessor drivers. The driver of the newest model Jeep waves first as a sign of respect to the older Jeep. 
There's even a complicated point system that we won't go into detail about because frankly, the points can't be redeemed for anything of value and I can't get my head around keeping score for a game that has no discernible ending. The Jeep Wave itself, while silly to someone who doesn't own a Jeep Wrangler, is proof of the impact of this automobile on American car culture. We as American motorists live for the open road. Jeep drivers yearn for the places that were too topographically challenging to construct safe roads. But don't get it twisted. The Jeep Wrangler is just as good at going to the grocery store as it is at scale a rough and rocky off-road hill. It's a convertible truck. How freaking America is that? Baseball, apple pie, and the Jeep Wrangler. Three things synonymous with America. The Jeep Wrangler, the truck that won World War II. The truck that revolutionized off-road sporting and paved the way for SUVs of the modern era. The truck that's not really a truck. It's a Jeep.